wonderful. Good to see all of you here tonight. I trust you've had a good day. God's been good to us today. And uh, I'm trusting you're ready to go to meeting tonight. We're in for a good time here in the house of the Lord. Memorial Day weekend. But God's blessed us in so many ways. We have so much to praise him for. If you want, let's stand and uh, we'll sing 139 at Calvary. Thank you so much. Let's pray together and ask the Lord to help us tonight. He knows what we stand in need of. Good to see all of you here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I want to thank you again for the privilege to come and gather in your house. What a great joy and opportunity we have to worship you tonight. Thank you, Lord, uh, for this, uh, this time that you've given us. And, Lord, what a wonderful time it is to think about all the blessings you've bestowed upon our lives as we I of course, commemorate Memorial Day this weekend. We're reminded of those who've given their lives, uh, Lord, that we can enjoy this freedom. But we're also thankful for you, Lord, who enables real liberty, liberty of the soul. And I thank you, Lord, so much for that. I pray, Lord, you bless now in the time together uh, tonight as we open your word. Bless the Lord and kids blast. Continue to pour into these young people that which they stand in need of, of your word. And we'll thank you and praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Remind you, of course, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, we're having our Bible study in uh, the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. Daniel's book, we're studying about a chapter a week. Sometime it takes me long enough to get through it. But I'm looking forward, of course, to chapter number 5, I believe it is, this week. So we're excited about that. Hope you can be here at 7 o'clock Wednesday night. And then, of course, next Sunday. Sunday school at 10 o'clock, Bible study hour at 10 o'clock, and our regular worship service at 11. And uh, don't forget uh, Vacation Bible School coming up. Be here before we know it. Uh, we'll be in June next Sunday, and uh, just a couple of weeks away, a few weeks away, we'll have Vacation Bible School, June the 10th through the 12th, with family night being on the 12th. I'm excited about that. I hope you are, too, and inviting someone. we got some flyers. You can pass out, invite kids, and encourage them to come and be a part of Vacation Bible School. Learn about Jesus. Amen. All right. 
I'm going to sing an old song tonight. If you know the words, you can sing along with me. Love is why. He never said I'd have silver or gold, yet he has promised me riches untold. He never suffered a life without care, yet he redeems every burden I bear. Sin stained the cross with the blood of my Lord, yet he permitted it without a word. Oh, why? Tell me why he redeemed you and me. Love is why you and I are free. Though I have none of this world's earthly goods, yet I'm an heir of all heaven affords. Though I may never achieve earthly fame, yet all of heaven can call me by name. Sin stained the cross with the blood of my Lord, yet he permitted it without a word. Oh, why? Tell me why he redeemed you and me. Love is why you Sister Karen, our kids are headed to Kids Blast, and they're going to have a blast tonight, and we're going to have a blast out here. Amen. Thank God for all these kids being here tonight, and Sister Melissa is ready, Brother Barry, going to help them out tonight. Amen. Sister uh, Gorham's going to help too. Good. Wonderful. They'll have a great lesson out there, and I'm excited for all of our kids and what God's doing in their life. First Timothy chapter number one. First Timothy chapter number one. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to First Timothy chapter number one. I want to read this one verse and uh, get our springboard for it tonight. Look at it for a few moments. First Timothy chapter number one. And I want to read this 15th verse. I could read all the surrounding verses. I'll make some application to some of them later. But I want to get our thought for this one verse tonight. The Bible says here in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 15, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, Paul says. And I'm grateful and thankful he's writing this uh, young man, Timothy, and he's giving him some dissertation to what is going to happen ahead in his life, what he needs to be prepared for. And in that, he discloses a faithful saying. I want to talk to you tonight about a faithful saying. A saying, a faithful saying. And when you read this uh, book and other books that Paul wrote, you'll find these words four times in the Bible. Four times, four different occasions, you'll find that statement this is a faithful saying. What's Paul talking about when he says this is a faithful saying? It's one of the considerations I think that's worthy of us looking at because of what Paul deals with when he says this is a faithful saying. The word saying speaks of something that has been said or impl implied to a topic. And, of course, it is uh, on four different occasions that Paul will use that terminology, a faithful saying, uh, to derive at a truth or a declaration concerning something that is so important, so important. The word faithful speaks of assurance, of a truth, uh, of something that you can depend on, uh, that which you and I can uh, confidently rely 
There's not too much in this world you rely on too much anymore that's uh, confidently. You have to test it and try it and hopefully it'll come through. But boy, I'm glad there's some faithful sayings in the Word of God that remain confident. It's a doctrine that may be credited without the slightest doubt of hesitation. Is what Paul's talking about, referring to when he says, this is a faithful saying. There are four of them in the word of God. They are doctrinal declarations, spiritual proclamations, if I can say it that way, that talk about what Paul wants to in Press upon, first uh, the one we're looking at tonight to this young man, Timothy. There's another one in this book as well that deals with a faithful saying. Tonight I want to look at this verse. This faithful saying, a declaration, a proclamation without, uh, without hesitation is an absolute belief on Paul's part. And he says there in verse number 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ. Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now I want to draw your attention to that one verse and we'll look at it for a few moments and dwell with the fact of this spiritual declaration, this uh, doctrinal declaration, spiritual proclamation of what Paul is conveying to this young man Timothy in this faithful saying. You see that verse, that one verse, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Look at what he's saying in this verse. It's a glorious condensation. A condensation coming down from above. And the Bible talks about it. Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, came into the world to save sinners, he says, of whom I am chief. It's one of the most important things that ever be revealed to the human ear is that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. Think about that statement for a few moments. What a great, great proclamation that is. What a great, great declaration that is that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And he saves them by the grace of God, through the Spirit of God, he saves them from their sin. It's a glorious truth. He came into this world. Now the Bible says it there. He came into this world. Paul talks about. And he's showing, of course, this coming down. That love brought him down. I thought about that song. That's the reason I sung it a while ago. Love is why you and I are free. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Paul said it this way to the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 6. He said, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. Of men. He was made in the likeness of men. And I'm grateful and thankful that is a truth of concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. He laid aside, of course, all the majesty in heaven to become you and I, come with you and I, come to this earth and took upon himself a form of the servant and was made in the likeness of men. The Lord Jesus came down from the heights of deity into the depths of humanity. I was reading and uh, reading about his condensation, his coming down to this earth. He came from heaven's adorations to earth's abominations. Think about that. In heaven, he's adored. But here upon this earth, boy, he sees all the abomination of mankind and sin. He came from heaven's coronation to earth's curses. In heaven, they adored him. They declared him as his rightful position, God. The Son of God, the coronations that he received there in the glories before he become man and dwelt among us. He came from heaven's excellencies to earth's excretions. Oh my, what a, what a, what a, a vast a difference from where he came. He came from earth's, heaven's glory and, and he, he was placed in earth's glory. Think about that. He came to the harvest of horrors. When he came and become one of you and I, yet he was without sin, the Bible says, but he dwelt among sinners. He came from heaven's hallelujahs to earth's hates. They hated him. The world at large hates him even today. They still despise him. He came from heaven's joy 
to earth's jeers. He came from heaven's majesty to earth's misery. He came from heaven's virtues to earth's vices. And what he gave up to become you and I, that is a form of a servant, to walk upon this flesh. And yet Paul is talking about this. Paul is de declaring this. He's making this declaration to the very fact that Christ Jesus came into this world. Hallelujah. Thank God he came into this world. Someone has said the old Greeks whose civilization developed along the lines of agriculture, painting, and decorative arts said God is beauty. That's what they declared. God is beauty. We show forth our gods in the beauty. The Romans, led by Caesar in a hundred uh, battles, uh, battlefields to victory, he came along and boasted that the Roman eagle never turned backwards. And he said, concerning Rome and their might and their power, he said, God is strength. God is declared in strength. The Jews, of course, inherited from Moses the great lawgiver and said, God is law. God brings clarification to them. The purpose we're here. But it wasn't until Jesus came that we discovered that really God is love. Isn't that amazing? All the civilizations of the world have tried to declare what God is, what the real uh, sense and uh, es essence of who, what God is really all about. And yet Jesus does it because he was God in the flesh. He was love, and he still is. Charles Spurgeon wrote on the Lord Jesus Christ coming into this world. He said, can you imagine the reaction of the angels when he began to leave the glories of heaven and all the majesty? Oh, how surprised they were when they found that, that this first, uh, first informed about Jesus, the Prince of Light and Majesty, intended to shroud himself in clay, a human like you and I. And yet he did. He came into this world. He gave himself, laid his reputation down in heaven, and became a form of a servant. And the Bible talks about it very well, and very clear. Jesus becoming flesh in the story of love. The children's song says, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. The, the love of God is never questioned. We know he loves us. And Christ Jesus came into this world because he loves us. And the Bible declares it. And yet songwriters have written about it. We sung about it a while ago. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. God in his love and God in his grace, no unmerited favor on our part, God just wanted to show and demonstrate his love and give it us his only begotten son, brought it down to man. I see, of course, that love brought him down, but I saw the lost. I see the lost. He is intended to save sinners. Paul said it this way, Christ came into this world, what? To save sinners. Love in the desire for mankind to redeem mankind, but yet the lostness of mankind brought him to this world. Christ Jesus came to save sinners. He came into this world, become a man that he might save man. The world, the world could see that he had a desire to save them. He said on one occasion, Luke chapter 19, verse number 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Lord Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And hallelujah, he's still saving sinners today. Aren't you glad of that? I had the beautiful privilege of attending a worship service last Sunday morning. Uh, I didn't go to Michael Nim's church. I went to one a little closer. And of course, uh, trying to keep the pace of all those grandkids and what was going on and the plans we were, we were having. I went to church uh, last Sunday morning uh, to a church there in uh, out, outside of Portland, there in outside of Happy Valley, really just a few miles from where Michael and lived, and watched a young man get saved by the marvelous grace of God. A man who had pastored the greater uh, Portland Baptist Church for 40 something years has stepped down, and now he's doing missionary work to these churches in the outer rims of Portland and other places around there. He spent his entire life there in Portland. Uh, born in Jacksonville, Florida. Listen to his testimony. What a great, great man of God. He brought him such a powerful message. And a young man sitting on the back row accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and came forward and told the world, declared to the world that Christ Jesus is still saving sinners. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. The Bible tells us, the angels announced it. For he knew he was born this day in the city of David a Savior. That's it. 
He's a Savior. That's what he came into this world for, a Savior. Mary herself could say, my soul does now rejoice, hath rejoiced in God, what? My Savior. You see, even Mary needed a Savior. Everybody needs a Savior. And Paul said it here. He said, the Savior of all men. He goes on to say in this first letter to Timothy, he is the Savior of all men. Reminds me, of course, of Hollywood's take on things. And, of course, they're fictional. We know that. In the movie uh, Superman Returns, 2006, you remember that movie, some of you Superman fans, back before they got real blurred. But, of course, he was always addressing the, the, uh, the question and the need of Superman's help. He was always addressing the world needs a Savior. The world needs someone to help them, someone to conquer their problems. Lois Lane, in that movie, she has a line that says, growing cynical of what's happening with Superman. She says in that movie, the world doesn't need a Savior, and neither do I. Now, we know it's a fictional character. We know it's a fictional story. But I will tell you, Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And that includes all of us. You see, unlike Lois Lane's portrayal in that movie, she does need a Savior. Amen. And we all need a Savior. Every man needs a Savior. I needed a Savior. You needed a Savior. If he had not come, I would not have a Savior. There was no one that could redeem us. No one that could save us. Except the Lord Jesus, the world would not have a Savior. The story is told of a little boy who had a, uh, in a dream of Christmas Eve, he saw himself dressed up, and dressed very early in the next morning, running down to the school ground to meet his playmates. And to his amazement, he, was, uh, he saw only a vacant lot, the corner of which the sign carried these words, If I had not come. If I had not come, he hurried to the hospital. Some of his friends were gathering in the morning with gifts and sticks for children, uh, uh, for the children that were sick, excuse me. And, and there again, he saw a big empty space and a sign that said, If I had not come. Bewildered, he thought of the early morning worship service, and he ran, expecting to join his parents in worship, only to see a much larger vacant lot and a strange sign that said, If I had not come. There he began to wake out of his sleep and realizing that Jesus was the Savior of the world. Hallelujah, Christ came into the world to save sinners. The songwriter had it right when he said, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a Savior. When he said, what condensation bringing us redemption that in the dead of night not one faint hope was in sight. God, glorious, tender, laid aside his splendor, stooping to woo and win and save my soul. Oh, down from his glory is that song. He ought to read the words of that song. What an amazing, remarkable song. And it's true, the glorious condensation. But I want you to see also, it's a faithful saying, Christ came into this world to save sinners. That's what he came for. But it's also a gracious uh, convert, convert uh, Conversion, a gracious conversion, you see in this, in this story. You see a gracious conversion. Paul says it's a faithful saying, Christ came into this world, what? To save sinners. And then he said, of whom I am chief. What a thought. You and I as sinners. He talks about his former life. Look at these verses, verses 13. He talks about and testifies that before he met Christ, he who was, verse 13, before a blasphemer and a persecutor, injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He talks about that word blasphemer. He declares that's what he was. Even though he was a religious man. You know the story of Paul, Saul, before he met the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. His previous life, he speak the ill of Christ Jesus. And Paul, of course, spoke, uh, he, he spoke unjustly and critical of Jesus and his followers. He had the permit to go catch, capture them. He said he was a persecutor. He acted in his hatred of Christ and Christians and sought to defame the name of Christ completely from the earth. Acts chapter 22, Paul's testifying. In his own testimony, words concerning his own testimony, he says this, And I persecuted this way unto the death. 
binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. He's talking about his previous life. Who were you and I before Christ saved us? Oh my, what a picture. He imprisoned everyone he could, put to death many for the cause of Christ. He was trying to strap out Christianity. Threatenings and slaughters had come to be the very breath of Saul. He's breathing out threatenings, the Bible says. He's like a war horse who sniffed the smell of the battle and pursued the Christians to try to stomp them out. Thirdly, he uses that word injurious. As a, 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 a man who was violent, so well violent, he used his blasphemy and persecutions to become injurious toward those. Didn't care how he treated them. And then he says, but I did it ignorantly in unbelief. You notice that? Ignorantly in unbelief. He declared the day that he didn't know what he was doing because he thought he was doing what God wanted him to do. Sort of like some of, uh, some of the world's uh, cults today and some of the world's false religions today. But God opened his heart to the truth and he realized he was a lost sinner. His former life, but then he talks about his forgiven life. If we look at verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. He had experienced the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who came into this world to save sinners. What a glorious transformation. Have you had that glorious transformation in your life? You recognize a time when you was an enemy to Christ and now... By the grace of God, you've been saved. How Paul was brought, Saul was brought to salvation, changed his name to Paul. But before he had denied Christ, he, he was devoted, before he was devoted to him, he sought to rid the earth of Christians, and now he sought to, seeks to make all men Christians. He speaks of in these verses. Look at verse 16. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy. That in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern of to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. You see what he's saying? Paul said, I'm an example of how Christ was long suffering, how he opened my heart, how he brought salvation to me, revealing to me who he was. Paul was an untamable tiger, one man said, but he met the lion of the tribe of Judah, and it changed him completely. And thank God he did on that Damascus road. He obtained mercy, he says there in verse number 16. He was shown mercy. He was shown grace. You remember the day of the night when you were shown mercy, you were shown grace. When God in his redemption reached down to you. That's the songwriter that could say, oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior and my God. Well, may this glowing heart rejoice and tell its raptures all abroad. A faithful saying. Worthy of all acceptation. It's a universal fact that he was a sinner. That we're all sinners. The Bible declares that very thing. Christ came in this world for sinners. To save sinners. He said of whom I'm chief. But the sinners are all. All of us. Every one of us are sinners. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 10. There's none righteous. No, not one. Chapter 3, and verse 23. For all have sinned. That literally means to fall short. To come up short in the, in, the, in the aiming of the target. You come up short every time. You and I came up short every time of God's righteousness, of God's redemption, of God, well, what, what it take to, would take to, to make us a fit candidate for heaven. We always came up short. I'm reminded of the story J. Vernon McGee talked about. He pastored there in L.A. and, of course, uh, parts of L.A. of there roundabout. He, he, he talked about the illustration of, of the game of jumping to the Catalina Island. He said you run straight off the pier at Santa Monica, straight in a line off that pier, run as hard as you can, and 25 miles from that pier is the Catalina Island. And he said, uh, we'd run and jump to see who could jump to Catalina. Now think about that. You know how foolish that is, don't you? 25 miles away. Who could run and jump off that pier? He said, but yet they would, there was a, a, a joke or a, 
I guess, a, a game that uh, people played, young people played, to run and see how far they could jump, to jump to Catalina Island. Catalina Island. He said as they jumped, of course, some could jump further than others. Some would make a bigger splash than others. He said, but they all came up short. Why, nobody could jump that far. All came up short of Catalina. Although some jumped farther than others, all come up short of the glory of God. What a true illustration that is. Doesn't matter how far you jump, how big a splash you make, you still come up short of God's requirement of righteousness. Therefore, it's by one by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. That's Romans chapter 5, verse 18. And that's exactly what Paul is declaring here. In this faithful saying, he says, I was the chiefest of sinners, and yet Christ saved me. Aren't you glad for these faithful sayings? This declaration of what God has done, the experience of his grace and mercy, that's why I came. That's why I came. A missionary to Central Africa was having great trouble trying to explain uh, to the natives there this word Savior who died to save them. Over two years had passed. He could not find a word that could adequately display and adequately uh, to, 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 for them to a definition that they could understand the Savior, how it could be translated clearly and accurately. One night he's sitting with some of the natives around the campfire when one of them, the most intelligent of the natives, began to tell him about a man, Mr. Craigler who had been attacked by a lion and badly torn, and how that he, this native, had jumped in and came and rescued the man from the lion. And he used the word of how he saved him. And that missionary, uh, Hoskis, Bruce uh, Willis Hoskis, began to declare to that native, that's exactly what Jesus did for you and I. That's exactly how he done it. He came to pull off the line of Satan that was trying to devour us and tries to kill us and tries to take our lives. And yet he said, Jesus, the Son of God, came to this earth and he saves you and I. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, aren't you glad of that? I'm so thankful for the Savior. The moment uh, he understood that, he began to understand real salvation of what Jesus Christ came into this world to do. Paul said it there. This is a faithful saying. Faithful saying. Worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world. To save sinners. Of whom I am chief. Let's stand together. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. <coughs> Thankful for this faithful saying. That God does save sinners. He still saves the worst of sinners. Paul declared that very fact, that he was the worst of sinners. And yet the Bible tells us that's exactly what God did in saving Paul. A faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world. He offers salvation to mankind. All that will believe can receive and receive the forgiveness of sin. My, what great mercy, what great love. I'm going to pray. We're going to have a verse of a song. God speaking to your heart. These altars are always open. You come. Do business with God. Father, I want to thank you for the truth we've seen tonight from your word. This faithful saying. Oh, Lord, I'm grateful for these faithful sayings of seeing in the word of God. How they declare your grace and your mercy. How they declare other things as well. But, Lord, in this declaration Paul makes here, 1 Timothy, he talks about this very fact of faithful saying, declaring that you save sinners of whom he was the chief. And, Lord, I feel the same way so many times. I'm grateful and thankful for your salvation. I pray, Lord, you do the work in our hearts that only you can do. In this invitation time, we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Watch your place in this verse. God's speaking to your heart. You need to come. You come. <laughs>